DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. For over 20 years, Dr. Bunsen has been active in the area of Catholic social communications and education, including writing, editing, and teaching on a variety of topics related to church history, the papacy, the saints, and Catholic culture. He is the faculty chair at the Catholic Distance University, a senior fellow of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and the author or co-author of over 50 books, including the Encyclopedia of Catholic History and the best-selling biographies of St. Damien of Molokai and St. Kateri Tekakowitha. He also serves as a senior editor for the National Catholic Register and is a senior contributor to EWTN News. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Matthew. Great to be with you, Chris. In our study of the Doctors of the Church, we're entering into a new era, aren't we? We are. You know, we're, we're still looking at the, the very last of the Fathers of the Church, but we're moving away from some of those great centers of uh, Christianity that we've been studying with the, the doctors and the early fathers, of course, of the great seas of the East. And then, of course, we've looked very heavily at uh, Italy, at, at Gaul, and, and even Spain. Now, as the faith has moved outward, thanks to the work especially of uh, Pope St. Gregory I, the Great, we can visit one of the, the places where it took root, and blossomed enough to produce uh, the only doctor of the church so far uh, to be named from England. And that, of course, is the Venerable Bede, who's honored as the father of English history, but who in 1899 was also declared a doctor of the church uh, by Pope Leo XIII in a testament to the endurance of the Catholic faith in the British Isles, but also as a, an immense honor to one of the greatest minds of his century, and that is a, a monk by the name of Bede. Why would Leo the Thirteenth choose Bede at that particular time in history to elevate as a doctor of the church? Yeah, I think there were a couple of uh, things that worked there. Bede, of course, had been honored uh, since uh, really the time of his, his death, around 735, as a saint. He was also honored, even in the time of his life, as one of the greatest minds, as I was saying, one of the greatest contributors to theology, to history, history in particular, but also to learning in general. And the, those two legacies of his sanctity and his learning survived throughout English history, even enduring after the reform, so-called, the, the English Reformation, in which uh, where his, his body was kept uh, was largely wrecked, and yet his body was preserved, and eventually it's, it's now uh, given a place of honor uh, in Durham Cathedral in England. So the restoration of the English hierarchy in the middle of the 19th century, after nearly 300 years of ruthless oppression by the crown, by the British government, by uh, British society, was a momentous moment. Part of it was this recognition uh, that Bede had so much to do with the foundation of Christianity and the spread of the intellectual achievement of Catholicism in the Middle Ages and then beyond. So we know that around 1859, uh, the English church petitioned uh, the then Pope Pius the Ninth uh, to declare Bede a Doctor of the Church. Now, as often happens, these sort of petitions take a while, and it was in recognition of the full uh, return, the full restoration of the Catholic Church in England that Leo the Thirteenth declared Bede uh, a Doctor of the Church on November thirteenth, eighteen ninety nine. I first came across his name in reading Dante of all things, where he places him in paradise with St. Isidore of Seville. Yes. Yeah, another doctor of the church uh, that, that uh, you and I have talked about. That gives us an idea of the, the reputation that Bede had in the centuries after his death. We know that, for example, St. Boniface, as he was embarking on his enormous campaigns of evangelization into Germany and into Northern Europe, 
was frequently writing to England asking for new copies, new manuscripts of Bede's work, not of the history, but of the commentaries that he had on scripture, because such were their beauty that Boniface wanted to use them. We know as well that uh, his manuscripts were copied and carried uh, across the whole of Europe and played a significant part in what became known as the Carolingian Renaissance, that rebirth of learning that accompanied the, the reign of Charlemagne. Bede has been honored over the centuries, chiefly, of course, for what was called his Historia Ecclesiastica, or his history, ecclesiastical history of, of the English. But it is, in realistic terms, uh, for his beautiful theology, his studies of uh, scripture, his biblical commentaries, his hagiographies, that we honor him as a doctor of the church, and, in fairness, his role as the father of English history. Because of his work in preserving so much of our knowledge of the development of the Christian faith in the British Isles. Can we overemphasize, Matthew, the importance of having that connection between theology and history, and history that is accurate in portraying the the fruits of that theology? No, I think you're I think you're absolutely right. You know, in our discussion of Saint Augustine, another doctor of the church father of the church, one of the greatest figures in the history of the church. We talked about in his uh, study of God, the significance of history in the faith. In other words, we're looking at the incarnation. We're looking at the fulfillment of salvation history, that, that God's providence in history is manifest and it culminates in the birth of Christ, but you can see it unfolding in time especially when we're talking about the history of the church, the, the role of the Holy Spirit in that. Bede understood history in those terms, much like the, the fathers of the church before him. He saw as the most significant event in the history of the world. The central event of history is the birth of Christ. It's for that reason that he's the one who took what had been a development by uh, Dionysius Exegus, in what we think of as the Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Bede is the one who is responsible in what was called the Chronica Maiora, and one of his books on history. The way to develop a universal calendar, uh, as he wrote, Ab Incarn Incarnatione Domini, in other words, from the incarnation of Christ. He is the primary reason why, all the way up until just in recent years, we universally saw the idea of B.C. and A.D., in other words, before Christ and then uh, Anno Domini or the year of our Lord. What he did was, uh, in, in previous centuries, he would calculate dates either from the founding of Rome, around 735 B.C., or according to 15-year cycles from a chosen date, oftentimes 312, because that was when the persecutions of the church ended under Constantine, or even more complicated, from the reinal dates of the different kings of whom you might be writing. So you can imagine the nightmare that that poses in trying to know when events were taking place. Thanks to Bede, we had a very handy way of seeing history from the eyes of faith, the reference point beginning moment is the birth of Christ, and everything went before that, and now everything flows from that. And I think um, we see in that the coming together of faith, of theology, with history, with that unfolding of salvation history. And that ties very closely as well, as, as we'll talk, uh, into his vision, his understanding of biblical commentaries. Not to enter into a overly complicated discussion about the importance of time, it, uh -huh. it is significant, I think, in this discussion, Matthew, that we have an appreciation why 
the chronicling of what we understand as Chronos time uh-huh. in uh, the salvation history is to a people who adore, worship, follow a God that is in Kairos time. It is outside of time. That it's uh-huh. important for us to have these lights like bead who help us to see the value of that Chronos. Well, yes, yes, that's it. And that uh, is one of the reasons why his ecclesiastical history of the English people uh, is of great value, uh, not just as a historical document, but also as a theological one. Because what is he talking about? In, in this book, he has a series of chapters in which he lays out basically the history, not the history of England, but the ecclesiastical history of the English peoples. Now, the, the stress is always on ecclesiastical, but also on peoples. And I say that because he understood very powerfully the, the flow of history. We have the penetration of God into the world of the incarnation, that from one time to another. And then we have the proclamation of the faith. So he was keenly aware of the Acts of the Apostles and used that as a kind of model for his historical writings, where you see the spread of the faith guided by the Spirit, the salvation of the world taking place in time, in our time. And so, chapter by chapter, he very methodically moves from England, really from the time of Julius Caesar and his uh, brief but interesting campaigns, to the significant arrival of Augustine of Canterbury, sent by Pope St. Gregory I the Great around 597 to evangelize the Angles. And then we have the slow, steady spread of the faith through providence. Uh, But he stresses the importance of unity, that here was a seemingly foreign faith that had briefly been in England, but had lost its connections with the wider church because of the barbarian invasions. You have the conversion of so many of the tribes, the Angles and the Saxons. You have great and terrible wars. Uh, I think, for example, of uh, the pagan king, uh, Penda of, of Mercia, who fought so hard against the surrounding Christian kingdoms, but eventually the whole of England was converted. These are the events that that had taken place barely within the the lifespan of Bede. And yet he saw the, the role of providence, as I was saying, the role of the spirit and that intersection of the divine with the human playing out in the drama of this one particular spot, and that would be the British Isles. And from that, you could extrapolate. You can see the spread of the faith across the entire world that followed upon that. Could we also say that this is a time many of us, given my my particular generation, we were taught that it was the Dark Ages, maybe archaically so, by some historians? Yeah. Um, The setting for Bede's life uh, is one of what we assume would be, or as you say, we're often told was dark and depressing and gloomy. The life that Bede led was amazingly quiet. It was filled with learning. It was, in fact, I think, um, a perfect model for how many of us would love to live our lives. As he himself said, I always took delight in learning or teaching or writing. He was a young man. Uh, he probably belonged to some kind of a family of aristocracy uh, among the English and in Northumbria, which is in the northeast of, of England. And he was probably given over to the monks at the age of seven and spent his entire life in a monastery. But what a monastery. And we have this image in our heads of, of an England racked with barbarians, uh, the church trying to suppress the light of learning from ever being rekindled. And yet, in this monastery of Jero in particular, where he spent much of his life, Wearmouth Jero, Bede 
became probably the, as I was saying, one of the foremost mines in the world at the time. The monastery had vast collections of manuscripts. He was constantly writing to Rome to have more sent. Uh, he had a friend within of Nothelm uh, who would send him manuscripts and who once visited him, bringing more manuscripts with him. And these monasteries became not just centers of learning, but centers of culture and hope for the future. And Bede was in the forefront of that, uh, educating young monks, writing books on an unbelievable number of topics. I mean, when, when you run through the, the, the categories that he wrote about, uh, history, rhetoric, music, astronomy, mathematics, poetry, grammar, philosophy, uh, he taught homiletics, and of course he taught scripture. He had knowledge about all of those things. Why? Because he himself was a kind of repository of the light that had seemingly gone out elsewhere in Europe. He was aware of the great classical writers. And we know that he knew Virgil, that, that he knew Tacitus, that he knew Cicero, these great writers of the Roman past. But he was also incredibly well informed about the recent writings of the fathers and doctors of the church in the centuries that had just gone beyond. So far from being some dark hole of ignorance and superstition, Bede represents uh, and was thriving in a system, a monastic system, a system of faith that was doing everything it could to promote learning, knowledge, and understanding. Of this father of English history, what do we know of his personal history? I mean, how did he become a part of the monastery? Yeah, well, it was um, custom at the time uh, for families to entrust some of their one of their children to the monasteries, usually for education. And we know that was certainly the case with with Bede. He, he part of his history of the English people was to write a kind of uh, autobiographical chapter so that the, the reader would have some idea of his own context, who he is, but also what he saw in his lifetime. And once he was in the monastery, he stayed there. And it is a testament to what the monks thought of him, that he was ordained a deacon at the age of 19. Now, it was custom, not always necessarily honored, but it was custom not to ordain anyone a deacon until they had reached the age of 25. But such was his uh, depth of learning, his, his knowledge, that he was given this, this great honor. Now, we know that he grew up in this beautiful monastic setting. He uh, almost certainly began at a, a monk Wehrmuth, uh, which had been started not too long before his birth, uh, and his first abbot was a very famous one by the name of Benedict Biscop. And then he was eventually moved to the monastery of St. Paul's in what is Jero. Those two monastic institutions were very closely tied, both of them in what was called the Kingdom of Northumbria. And his uh, main leader there, the abbot by the name of Caelfrith, became one of his best friends and, and his, his guide, his mentor. And it tells us something about Bede that around 686, a plague exploded in Jero and claimed the lives of virtually every one of the monks, save for two. One was Caelfrith, and the other was simply listed by the later chroniclers as a, a young boy. And we know that that young boy was Bede. He was entrusted by Caelfrith in helping to maintain the liturgical life of the monastery until new monks could arrive and other monks could be trained uh, in that duty. At the age of 19, he was ordained a deacon, which was itself unusual because the custom, not always followed, uh, was that you not be ordained until... Uh, the age of 25. And then we know that uh, around the age of 30, uh, probably around 702, he was ordained a priest, this time by 
uh, a man who admired him greatly, the name of John Bishop of Hexham. And by that point, Bede had already established himself in the monastery and within the wider monastic community for his uh, intelligence. And he really, from around 701, uh, began turning out what turned out to be probably in excess of 60 books. We have copies of most of them surviving. And as I was saying, other things that he wrote were lost in the terrible events of the succeeding centuries. So his life would have been one of wonderful stability. Uh, He would have given his entire life to learning, to teaching, to praying, to the daily routine of the monastery, and how peaceful, tranquil, and remarkable it must have been. Leave it to that rule of stability. Matthew, please talk to us about how he was received by the rest of the world. Yeah, well, of course, uh, with the passage of time, he was uh, somebody who lived in this tranquil, content, uh, monastic environment. And I have the impression that he was somebody who was so focused for so long on his writing, on his teaching, that he was more or less content to live in that wonderful environment, even though, of course, his fame grew very rapidly. We know that he was invited uh, to a number of places and actually traveled in around 733 to York uh, to visit the bishop there. And uh, uh, soon after, it was elevated to the the rank of an archdiocese, an archbishopric, the, the, the See of York. So in all likelihood, he uh, at least discussed the possibility of going to that and continued to receive these invitations to travel. And as time went by, of course, uh, as I was saying, he was content to stay in the monastery, but his health was also declining. But we know that even within his lifetime, he was known as the Venerable. When uh, he received a letter from Pope Sergius uh, inviting him to come to Rome, he was called the Venerable by the Pope. And it was a testament not just to his age, but to his sagacity. When we think, for example, of the old having great wisdom, well, in Bede's case, that was absolutely true. He was venerable by virtue of his genius Uh, And, of course, in time, it became uh, attached to him by virtue of the process of canonization. But his fame was absolutely uh, across, certainly, uh, Western Christendom. And, of course, it was very well deserved. How did he die? His passing was typical of the monks of his time. It, It came very slowly. And it came surrounded uh, by the support of his brothers and, uh, typical also of Bede, uh, it was surrounded by prayer. It was attended by prayer. Prayer for him, of course, was part of his daily life, but it was especially pronounced in the life of Bede. Of course, his name uh, comes from the Old English uh, for prayer. So his entire life was dedicated to that, so it was hardly surprising that he died as he had lived. It was said, according to uh, one of the people who chronicled his life, Cuthbert, that it began slowly with attacks of uh, a loss of breath, but without any pain. And that struck him just before Easter in 735. And uh, again, typical of somebody who had spent so many, many years in the monastery, he dictated right to the very end, and he spent the entire night in prayer, and again continued to dictate just practically up to his last breath. But just before he died, he distributed uh, among the different priests who were friends of his some of his most prized possessions, including, it, it is noted, uh, napkins, some incense, and, of course, one of the great, uh, most expensive commodities in the world at the time, pepper. Uh, because in an age in which uh, uh, flavorings were sometimes difficult to come by, pepper was considered uh, 
a real treasure. And so the gift of it to his uh, fellow priests, I think, was well received and, and would have been uh, accounted as a, an act of great generosity. He died on Thursday, May 26, 735, what was uh, Ascension Day. And the, his body was, of course, given a, a suitable burial and was eventually uh, transferred to Durham Cathedral. And I mention this because it is typical of the respect paid to the great saints and the legacy of the English church that his tomb was despoiled uh, under orders of King Henry VIII as part of the whole dissolution of the monasteries. And they were probably saved uh, and uh, reburied uh, in the Cathedral of Durham and uh, continued to receive respect even in the face of the anti-Catholic persecution that followed. What would you have us remember about his legacy then? When we look at Bede as a doctor of the church, we see somebody who contributed to the historical, the theological, the scientific, the scriptural life of the church. Somebody who, in his lifetime, was beautifully respected, uh, but who contented himself with a life of work, of teaching, and of prayer. And it is said that the simple things in life can be the hardest. Well, if that's the case, then, then be mastered the, the truly hard things of life. And when we despair of all the things that are pressing in around us as we try our own journey of the faith, we can look to Bede as a model of tireless, quiet dedication to the church. Dr. Matthew Bunsen, thank you so much. Great to be with you, Chris. Looking forward to our next episode. You've been listening to The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. To hear and or to download this program along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to support our efforts. But most of all, we pray that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen.